I guess that's right. Okay, if we could get people to take their seats. Uh, I'm John Holdren from the Kennedy School. Uh, I am the immoderate moderator of this panel. And um, I'd like to make a few uh, opening remarks at the moderator's discretion and tell you where this session is going to go, and then I'll introduce the panelists, and then we will proceed. Peter's smiling at me. My remarks will be brief. Whatever you choose to do will be great. So I start by saying that climate science has established a number of things beyond any reasonable doubt. Uh, one of them is that the climate uh, has been changing for many decades in ways that are not explained uh, by natural influences. The second is that the definitive explanation is the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere caused by society's emissions of greenhouse gases from coal, oil, and natural gas principally, but also to some extent from deforestation and some other sources, land use change of a variety of kinds. Uh, the third is that the changes are already causing harm, harm to human life, health, property, economies, and ecosystems. In other words, we know beyond any reasonable doubt that climate change is not just a future problem, a problem for our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It's a problem for people now alive. Uh, the fourth thing that we know beyond any reasonable doubt is that the changes and the harm will get worse in the future no matter what action we take. And the reason for that is that there are time lags in the climate system and in the energy system that make it inevitable that even if we were to take the most drastic imaginable action to reduce emissions, the temperature would continue to go up for some time to come and sea level would continue to go up for a long time after that. Uh, but the fifth thing that we know beyond reasonable doubt and that is very important is that the future harm will be much smaller if society takes strong remedial action than if it doesn't. Uh, I would argue that these realities alone are enough to justify the major efforts in climate change mitigation, that is measures taken to reduce the pace and the magnitude, the ultimate magnitude of the changes in climate that result from human activities, uh, and measures to which most of the world's nations are now committed. Uh, that is justified, again, beyond any reasonable doubt. Many more details than I've offered in these five about the patterns in which climate is changing and the ongoing impacts on human well-being are known with high confidence. And that knowledge of important details is very helpful determining how much mitigation, how soon is likely to be needed in order to avoid, as is often said, the worst consequences of global climate change. But we need to know more. There are many details, including some very consequential details, about which the remaining scientific uncertainties are troublingly large. Uh, examples include many aspects of the impacts of climate change on human health, the responses of terrestrial and marine ecosystems, including impacts on biodiversity, on agriculture, on fisheries, uh, including the ways that human-induced climate change is interacting with natural climate phenomena such as El Nino to affect atmospheric and ocean circulation and the frequency and intensity of weather extremes. There are particularly large uncertainties associated with the geographic distribution of many of the future impacts of climate change. And understanding distribution is crucial for planning adaptation measures because while reducing greenhouse gas emissions anywhere, that is mitigation, brings benefits everywhere, adaptation measures have to be tailored to what's happening in specific locations. We're really fortunate today to have as our panelists in this session four topic experts on aspects of climate change where while quite a lot is known, quite a lot is also uncertain. And they're going to tell us for their areas of expertise what we know, what we don't, why it matters, and what the prospects are for learning more. And they're going to do this in only a few minutes per person. Uh, one of our four panelists uh, is going to be late. Uh, the order in which people appear here is the order in which folks will speak. And we left uh, Caroline to be last because she is uh, going to be a little late. So the panelists are in the order in which they're speaking. Ji Ming Kuang, the Gordon McKay Professor of Atmosphere, Atmospheric and Environmental Science at Harvard. 
whose research focuses on how tropical convection interacts with large-scale flow to affect tropical circulation, especially rainfall distribution and variability. Next will be Peter Hybers, professor in Earth, of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard. His research interests include trends and predictability of extreme temperatures and implications of climate change for food production. Uh, third will be Dan Frag, the Sturgis Hooper Professor of Geology, Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering at Harvard, as well as my uh, co-chair of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy uh, program at the Kennedy School and uh, director of Harvard University Center for Environment. His research interests include climate change over Earth's history and energy technology and policy. And the last speaker, who I hope gets here in time, uh, Carolyn Bucky is professor of epidemiology at the Chan School of Public Health, associate director of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics, uh, and her research uses mathematical models and data science to understand the mechanisms driving the spread of infectious diseases. So let me now turn it over to Ji Ming Kwan. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Um, so I was asked to speak a little bit about um, uh, tropical rainfall and clouds, how they would change with climate change. Uh, so I should preface what I'm going to say by saying that uh, settled is actually a very strong word in science. So I agree wholeheartedly with what John said about those things uh, about climate change. Those are settled uh, science questions. Um, so things uh, rainfall and clouds are both involve water vapor. I'm going to start with water vapor. For that, we actually have very good knowledge of. Um, so we do expect water vapor to increase by about 7% uh, per degree of warming. So that's largely a matter of physical law. Um, there's a little bit of wiggle room in terms of how close we are to saturation, but there's not much wiggle room there. So that we know uh, from theory and also from observations about the seasonal cycle from uh, year to year variability. So we know that uh, pretty well. I'm going to use that fact later on uh, to explain some of the um, projections and observations. Uh, and in terms of global average rainfall, we don't expect that to change this much by seven degree. Uh, uh, seven percent per degree. We expect to be about one percent to three percent uh, per degree warming, and that has to do with the surface energy balance um, that considerations. Um, and uh, in the tropics, uh, rainfall in general are organized in rain, uh, rainfall belts, uh, often called uh, intertropical convergence zones. Are the names. Um, and we know that they could change and have changed in the past. And when they change, they do have uh, enormous consequences on our local livelihood. So um, uh, in terms of the projection to the future, uh, the climate models in general show a pattern of uh, wet get wetter. Um, so, and the one explanation for that is simply that uh, in these uh, rainfall uh, belts, um, a lot of the rain that's falling, a majority of the rain that's falling is coming from w uh, water that's converged into the column rather than evaporation locally. So when you have more water vapor, like 7% more per degree warming, then you can watch more water vapor, therefore a stronger rainfall. Uh, there's some other arguments, uh, more kind of a capitalistic argument to say, okay, that actually even enhances the local rainfall even more, but there's more uncertainty in, in, in that regard. Um, so um, in terms of uh, where uh, the rain belt will, will move, uh, that's more uncertain. We have seen some evidence and uh, have projections on the uh, how they sell or the rain uh, rain belts um, and the dry zones in the subtropics expanding more forward. There's some good reasons to um, to expect that, but there's also uh, quite a bit of uncertainty. I wouldn't say that's settled. Um, and um, in terms of uh, extreme rainfall, um, our models are fairly consistent in saying that uh, extreme rainfall will become more common in the future and become more extreme. Uh, and the argument there um, at a very basic level is still because there's more water vapor in the air. So if everything else being equal, you converge more water, and then you rain more. Okay. Um, so all else being equal is a very strong statement. So, um, so this uh, result, I would say, has some uncertainty associated with that, in particular because uh, a lot of extreme rainfall we see come from organized convective systems, hurricanes being one example, and the models don't represent them particularly well. Okay. So uh, in terms of hurricanes, as one example of extreme rainfall, um, so projections uh, uh, is that uh, for the total number of uh, hurricanes, uh, they might uh, decrease slightly or remain about the same. 
but the expectation is that the strong hurricanes tend to become more often, uh, uh, more frequent. Um, and I also want to say a few things about clouds. Uh, obviously, they produce uh, rain, uh, um, but the other aspect of them is uh, they are agent for really the feedbacks of, out of the climate system. We perturb that with greenhouse gases, but clouds can mod mod modify that perturbation, either enhance it or decrease it. So I think the consensus view is that uh, clouds will enhance that uh, perturbation, and but but how much is actually quite uncertain because we have many different types of clouds. Uh, so if you say take a flight out of uh, California, you have these very low clouds, they cool the planet, and they go to Hawaii, they have these broken tree cumuli clouds, and then go into uh, uh, the deep tropics, you have these deep uh, uh, cumulonimbus clouds with huge anvils. So we do know, I think, I, I, I consider this settled that uh, as climate changes, those uh, cumulonimbus in the tropics will become deeper. Okay, the top level of those clouds, the anvil clouds, the temperature will remain about the same, but the surface warms. Therefore, the greenhouse effect from those clouds will become stronger. I think that's pretty well uh, uh, established. Uh, but the extent of those uh, anvil clouds, uh, how they will change is less, less certain. Okay? And uh, in terms of those uh, shallower clouds, uh, that's cooling the planet and how they will change with climate change. Um, the general uh, consensus is uh, it's going to be an amplifying effect. But again, there's a quite range of uncertainty in there. Uh, so you may ask, why do we have all these uncertainties? Even when uh, climate models seem to be showing pretty consistently the same, same thing, I don't consider that uh, entirely settled yet. It's because uh, a lot of the processes that generate uh, these clouds and uh, rainfall are, um, are pretty complicated to represent in climate models. Okay, I remain hopeful because we actually can represent them quite well in isolation. Uh, it's really uh, the accuracy and uh, the efficiency we can integrate them into the global climate models. That's uh, where we need to put most of our effort into in order to bridge the gap. Great. Thank you. Let's turn to Peter Ivers. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, th thanks for all coming here. Um, and, uh, you know, in a day where we've uh, really spent um, thinking about the, the broad contours of how we can act uh, to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, it's, it's nice to have a little bit of time to kind of think about some of the basics that we're founding uh, these conclusions upon, uh, at least in terms of uh, the scientific understanding. Um, I, what I, what I want to do is um, uh, just kind of give you a vignette. Um, you know, I don't think we can teach a 101 climate course here to say, hey, these are the 58 things we do know and the 100,000 things we don't know. Um, but but I, I'm going to tell you about this in kind of one particular way. And it, 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 in some ways, it uh, kind of harkens back to, um, I could paraphrase uh, a Mark Twain quote. Right? It, it's not so much uh, what you don't know. It's what you think you know for sure, but just ain't so. That, that really can get you. Um, and so yeah, I want to talk about uh, climate, crops, and food security in a few minutes. Okay, and so, so let, let's imagine you have, um, let's say, Iowa, you're growing corn. If, if I know what the maximum daily temperature is during the growing season, I can give you to about 90% accuracy what the yield is going to be in Iowa at the end of the season. Right? And there's a very strong statistical connection there. Okay. Now, if I take that statistical model that I can fit to the temperatures and I say, Okay, now let's go to 2100, and we have a high emission scenario, and we ask what are the temperatures going to be? What are the yields going to be in Iowa at the end of the century? Um, the numbers I would get is that it's, you know, it's about a 60% reduction in yield, which is potentially catastrophic if that were somehow emblematic of what global food production were to look like under a warming world. Okay, so, but now let's come back and revisit some of the assumptions there. Okay, any farmer will tell you, well, it's not just the temperature. It's the water, it's the sunlight, there's all sorts of other environmental factors. And so if we go and we look in a little bit more detail, you see that the temperature and the water availability are very tightly coupled, right? If it rains, it's cool, both because the clouds are there and because the surface soils can evaporate. And so this strong correlation between temperature and hydrology means the temperature could just be a proxy for the water that's available. And then when you look how important is water versus temperature and you really start to pick it apart, there's a very strong case both statistically and from a physiological perspective to say hydrology is extremely important for determining the yield as well. Okay, then we look, as we go over decades, what else is gonna happen? Okay, atmospheric CO2 concentrations are gonna go up, unfortunately, at least in the coming decades, uh, probably longer. The uh, degree of fertilization that will occur 
because of higher atmospheric CO2 is still a highly uncertain factor as well. And then farmers are not just reactive agents, they're going to adapt. How are we going to change our farming practices? How are cultivars going to change going forward? And we can go on and on. Okay, and so there's all these other factors that need to be accounted for when we go from what's really a simple weather prediction at the end of the season to something that's more complex as a climate prediction. Uh, and if we work these calculations in other ways, we can get, really get a wide variety of different predictions. And so the point here is that there is complex nuances that we need to unravel in order to be able to make good predictions. And having kind of a good knowledge and insight into where we do know what is working and where we know we can extrapolate and where we can't is really crucial. Now for this corn in Iowa, probably it's gonna go feed cows primarily uh, in order to provide meat. And that is one sort of economic activity that has some value associated with it. But if we think about it at a global level, for instance, a place like southern Madagascar, where weather variability is going to be incredibly important in a very different way, and this is primarily smallholder farmers who are already generally living at a margin where they don't have much room uh, to absorb shocks. In this case now, if you go into a regime where climate change is going to make yields worse in the future, it could really portend severe food insecurity. And so in, in certain locations, I think it becomes quite critical to be able to make accurate predictions. In those cases, an accurate prediction versus an inaccurate prediction can really, I think, make all the difference between a policy that will be effective versus one which doesn't. And the, heaven forbid, I think we need to have a certain degree of modesty to know when our predictions um, just uh, maybe are so-so, are but not in fact uh, kind of uh, sufficiently knowledgeable. And so I would just like a little bit like what Ming was focusing on. Some critical aspects of future predictions really involve the hydrology of the climate system. Highly uncertain because there's a great deal of complex processes. Um, and we also need to understand adaptation in a lot of different ways, but I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Peter. Um, so, so I'm going to take the same approach as Peter, but I'm not going to drill down on one thing. I'm going to not tell you all the things we know about climate change. That would be ridiculous. I'm going to tell you the one thing I think we have really know about climate change that maybe we didn't know 20 years ago. Um, and then mention a few things that we don't know that I think are really important to take notice of. Um, I will totally agree, though, with Peter that any human system is incredibly complicated, and we generally underappreciate humans, and agricultural systems are human systems, too, um, remarkable adaptive capability. Humans are incredibly adaptable, and we should, when we're talking about human response to climate change, it becomes a lot more complicated. Um, Step back for a second. We've known about greenhouse warming for 120 years or more. Um, we've known the basic physics of the problem. But I think what a lot of people don't appreciate is that until recently, we didn't know one really important factor, which was how fast the ocean was warming. About 15 years ago, a program called Argo launched a whole bunch of robots in the ocean. Essentially, these are floats that measure vertical temperature and salinity profiles. And it's an international program. There's like 30 countries that have contributed floats. The US has contributed the most, but it's an international program. And uh, it was literally like turning the lights on in the ocean. Transformed oceanography. And oceanography is still trying to deal with this complete change, because before that, Oceanographers collected data by going out in a ship, lowering a wire with an instrument. And uh, the great physical oceanographer, Hank Stommel, used to say that this was like doing meteorology by driving around the country with a handful of pickup trucks towing or cars in the middle of the night with, a, with clouds where you couldn't see into the sky and towing some kites with instruments. I mean, that was literally what they would do. Um, what we've learned from that is that the oceans are warming. And that sounds trivial. But it's really important because what you have to understand is when the greenhouse gases increase in the atmosphere, more than 90% of the energy imbalance created by adding those greenhouse gases goes into actually heating the ocean. So ocean warming is global warming. We just couldn't measure it. It's not just the surface, it's the whole ocean because as the ocean warms, the heat mixes downward. And we now have a much better understanding. There's still errors, but we have a much better understanding of what that is. And therefore, I think that dramatically increases the predictability overall of where the system is going in the decades ahead. We have a sense of how the Earth system is responding because 
it is the dog. The surface is the tail. And that's important um, to understand. So I think that insight is incredibly important. And 20 years ago, I don't think we were quite as confident in, in that doesn't mean, <clears throat> any, anyway, th that's, that's, I think, one of the great things we do know now. There are a few things we don't know, though. And let's start with the carbon cycle. This is something John Holdren has worked on, but it's really important. There are a number of factors in the carbon cycle that I think could um, make us lose control of this problem. For me, top among them is the vast amounts of carbon stored in the permafrost in Siberia. Um, Siberia, there's a geological reason why there's so much carbon there. It hasn't been scraped clean by glaciers. There were no glaciers during the last several million years of the ice ages. And so um, there's huge amounts of very cold soils with very labile organic carbon. And as soon as that thaws, bacteria will turn it back into CO2. The question is how fast? And that's a really hard problem. And it's made even more difficult because doing field work in Siberia right now is kind of challenging and sharing data and stuff like that. Um, how fast could that happen? I mean, there, there's about as much carbon stored in the permafrost, and we don't really know, but there's about as much as we've already burned up until now in fossil fuels. So it's a huge amount. And the question is, does it come out in 100 years, in 500 years, or 1,000 years? The answer is, we really don't know. And um, that's a huge uncertainty. I would say the other thing that worries me a little bit is extreme precipitation. And I was driven to this because of what Ziming was just talking about. So in two summers ago in July, the city of Zhengzhou in China experienced an extraordinary rainstorm. If I had asked Ziming, who's, for those of you who don't know, he's one of the great tropical meteorologists in the world. And Zhengzhou is not really tropical. It's 34 degrees latitude, so it's like North Carolina or something like that. But, but you would know about that too. If I had asked you what were the probability of having eight inches of rain in one hour in Zhengzhou, you would have probably said, no, that's not possible. And yet it happened. Eight inches of rain in one hour. If you look online, you'll see the pictures of subway cars filling up with water as people clung to the ceilings of the subway cars to keep air to breathe. Terrifying, because I grew up taking the subway to school. Um, uh, not that many people died. 50 people died. But it was the most extraordinary uh, event. Two falls ago, three and a half inches of rain fell in New York City and in one hour and people drowned in their basement apartments in Queens. So this sort of unexpected vulnerability from surprising things that everything we know about climate says shouldn't happen, and yet it's happening, that's making me a little bit nervous, too. So I'll stop there, but I think that just gives you a sense. One final sentence, which is just that most of what we don't know tends to be dangerous, and I think that's not a coincidence. I think it's because... Climate scientists, we're pretty conservative. We're careful. We don't like to talk about things that we don't understand. And I think most of what we don't understand is not going to be so pleasant. Um, so I'm the odd one out on this panel, not just my second X chromosome, but also <laughs> I'm not a climate scientist. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, and I work mostly on vector-borne diseases and waterborne diseases. Um, so... Uh, Peter asked me to talk about sort of the, the data, knowns and unknowns, around health threats moving forward with climate change. Uh, and I think um, vector-borne diseases is, is good, uh, a good example because much of the um, literature on this um, makes predictions based on range expansion of different vectors. So whether it's ticks for Lyme disease or range expansion for the Aedes mosquito, which spreads arboviruses like dengue. Um, the trouble with that is that um, it's much more complicated than that. It's not just a human and environmental system. It's also coupled with pathogens who evolve um, and the insects themselves. So if you just take malaria and dengue as an example. So malaria is spread by a rural mosquito. It largely affects the rural poor. 
in the tropics and subtropics. Dengue is an urban and peri-urban disease spread by an Aedes mosquito. Um, so these breed in puddles and trash and are largely associated with cities and towns. So most of the predictions about the threats of these two different pathogens, malaria and um, dengue, result from predictions of changing rural to urban migration, so larger urban populations into the future, um, increasing encroachment of human populations into forests and, and things like that. And so, in general, the malaria predictions that are tacked onto climate models predict reduced malaria threat with urbanization, and the dengue models predict increasing arboviral threats, including things like Zika and so on. Um, and that's largely because the predictions say that there's going to be more and more people in cities and increased rural to urban migration, coupled with some, what, some of what we know about the temperature dependency of transmission. So most of these mosquito vectors have a nonlinear relationship between temperature and the extent to which they can transmit the pathogen. So there's some peak temperature where they're transmitting very rapidly, and then it drops off. There are also complex nonlinear relationships with rainfall. So if there's too much rainfall, the breeding sites wash away. If there's not enough, people are storing water in containers, and then the mosquitoes breed in the containers. And I think that is where our real unknowns are, because um, even with that example, it's not the case that dengue is distributed always where dengue is possible and where people live, because human behavior matters, our interventions matter, and these insects and the pathogens themselves are evolving. So we used to think that malaria was just a rural problem that would go away when urbanization was happening. But now we know that the mosquitoes are actually evolving to transmit, for example, in Bombay. They've now spread, this particular Anopheles species has now spread to East Africa, and we're seeing peri-urban and urban malaria in cities there. So all that's to say, we can't simply tack on some temperature relationship that we know with a vector or any pathogen that's environmentally driven and assume that we can just tag it onto a climate model and extrapolate into the future. These are evolving adaptive systems. And one of the problems is that the heterogeneities and the data collection for health happen on a different temporal and spatial scale than many of the models that we have from the climate scientists. So that makes it very hard to make sense of what's happening mechanistically. Um, and so we need more collection of data on the right spatial and temporal scale in order to be able to make sensible predictions. And I'll just fi finally say that you know, even as some, something as simple as attributing deaths to climate disasters is actually very complicated. It's easy enough to say somebody died in a hurricane from drowning, but what about the fact that the hurricane led to systematic disruption of primary care, people couldn't get dialysis, their meds didn't stay refrigerated, and they die six weeks later, as we saw in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and has, as we've seen in other disasters. So even basic attribution in terms of health in relation to climate is still a big unknown. And so there's a lot to do just in terms of bringing the data into the right scale so that we can ask some of these basic questions. Great. Do you need a mic? Do people need a mic? Or can hear everybody hear us? Mm -hmm. I think they can hear us. Okay, maybe we don't need the mic. Well, first of all, let me thank the panelists both for their cogent presentations and for staying within time, uh, which is always a challenge in these events. Uh, before we open it up to questions uh, from the audience, I'm just wondering uh, if any of the panelists have a question they're dying to ask another panelist. <laughs> a little, little interaction here on the, here, here on the stage. Uh, let, let, let me try. So, so Dan, you, you brought up um, you know, it's really the, the coupling between the physical environment and then the human systems where the complexity arises. And if there's any part of the physical system that's complicated and hard to predict, is what Ji Wang was talking about. And if there's any kind of outcomes that are particularly hard to understand, it's, you know, when, when people are put in harm's way, how are they going to respond immediately? Or what's going to help and happen with health um, risks going forward? We could also talk about migration. We could talk about conflict. Um, how do so, so the, the question that was going on in my mind when I was listening both Dan and Carolyn, how do we come to understand this coupled interactions? We can't really do control experiments in a normal way. We can't really look to historical analogs because we're in a new regime. 
Um, and yet, yeah, these are the most crucial questions to really to be able to get at. And, and so how, how does one study this in an effective way? How do you develop and test your knowledge? You know, it, you're exactly right. And it's even worse than that, because what we actually really care about is not incremental changes, you know, well, people's GDP dropped by X percent. What we actually care about really is where the breaking points are. Where do things fall apart? And the theory for that doesn't is even harder, right? The coupled human uh, environment system, where are the breaking points and where do things really go awry? Because cause, cause that's where we want to really short up the report. Um, uh, uh, I think I think our understanding of that is, is incredibly poor. Um, I would say that we can start measuring things better. We can start systematically collecting environmental data within our health system so that it's all in the same place and we can start to tease apart some of these things. But fundamentally, we need a different kind of approach to research as well. It's less siloed um, and is is much more engaged in a, in a sort of holistic exploration of, of what's going on mechanistically with both, with both sides of the equation, social and environmental. Um, I think there are a lot of gaps. Uh, ge geographically, there are a lot of gaps. Um, and in terms of um, subject matter, I think that there's just some, a lot of data collection that could be done right away. And Peter, I mean, we should say this to the audience. The three of us here, Peter, Caroline, and I, along with Tarun Khanna from the Business School, Sachit Balsari, and Jennifer Leaning from the School of Public Health. Um, we've been getting together every Wednesday morning all semester, talking about how to adapt to climate change in South Asia. And um, <coughs> this, is a, this isn't a statement of fact, it's a, it's a concern. Looking at the projections for the whole South Asian subcontinent, not just India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, but other smaller countries around. You're talking about 2 billion people. And I don't know whether it's 2100 or 2150, but it doesn't, it, in some of the scenarios, it doesn't look like those regions, they at least might not be really habitable. That is, it becomes so bad, some of the heat waves. A year ago, India and Pakistan had a heat wave for 30 days that was almost 50 degrees Celsius. Um, the projections where that gets much worse, you know, this really does come up against limits, and um, that's troubling. And, and you're right. It's not, it's not something that a climate scientist is going to solve, or a public health person, or a disease epidemiologist, or it, it's going to require a lot of different perspectives. And, I think that's the conversation we need to have. So I'm going to get even with Peter Hybers for asking the first question, and I'm going to ask the second to him. And, and, and it has to do with the, the uh, challenges of taking into account interactive stresses, where more than one thing is going on at once. And the example I'm interested in in asking you this question is the extent to which uh, plant pests and plant pathogens and their likely response to climate change gets taken into account and moved to the model of future agricultural uh, productivity. Uh, I think it's uh, generally accepted that plant pathogens and pests do better in a warmer, wetter world. And uh, how much better they do and whether the uh, technologies for controlling pests and pathogens evolve faster than their, uh, their own Evolution. Yeah. What, what do you yeah. think about that? Yeah, dealing with life is hard. Is is the is the anytime something's alive and it adapts, it acts. Um, the the um, I, I started out with, the, with this Iowa maze example for a specific reason, um, which is uh, there. It's a very simple system in that this corn is almost unlimited in terms of its ability to grow, other than the weather weather that it happens to experience. Between pesticides, between rapid rotations of cultivars. Uh, <coughs> Uh, copious fertilization, what you have is a system that is essentially kind of unbounded. But the yields that you're getting in Iowa three days are unlike the yields you get anywhere else in the world. Because almost everywhere else that you're growing crops, you do have all sorts of other limiting factors as well. Um, and so pests are, are a major concern. Uh, I'm, I'm picking primarily 
South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa and Central America, uh, both because you have um, many of these, we're talking about many of the tropical regions of the world where you do have these warm, uh, moist environments that allow for rapid uh, reproduction of pests, but also these are cases places where the food insecurity is the highest. A um, couple of things that are expected, right? Met 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 metabolic rates will go up as temperature goes up, therefore the ability for a pest to reproduce will go up. Um, what we're also going to expect is an expansion of, uh, kind of the range in which these pests can uh, survive. And so we, we have uh, serious concerns at the same time. If I go to try to study this and I say, what sorts of pesticides are being used? What sort of pests are available and are kind of uh, endemic to different regions? Um, there's almost no way that I can access data in any sort of kind of comprehensive way to do this. We don't really know. Right? What we have is a lot of anecdotes. And so to go back to something that Carolyn was saying, systematic acquisition of data while things are changing so that we can study them and understand what those trends are and then respond to them effectively, uh, I think is another theme that, that kind of emerges here. So okay. state of knowledge is low, but concern is high. So let's turn to the audience. I bet there are plenty of questions. John, can I ask you a question first before we do okay. it? <laughs> Certainly not. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Uh, just you have worked on the tundra, the permafrost issue, for a long time. You're part of a big consortium working on this, and it really is a huge potential driver of climate change. We could literally lose control. It doesn't matter how fast we stop using fossil fuels; it does actually. But but the scale of this is huge. At the same time, Alaska is not a, or northern Canada is not an analog for Siberia. Siberia is where it's happening. And you've been working with Russians on disarmament issues for your whole career. But we're in a state with Russia that's, that I don't think we've seen since maybe since the 50s or 40s. Um, so I just love your perspective on that because you've thought about this so much. Well, there are multiple layers to that question. You said there are multiple layers to the problem. Um, Yes, uh, some of us have been collaborating with Russians for many years, not, not just on arms control, uh, but on climate change, on energy technology, and on permafrost. And the permafrost issue is particularly problematic today because there's more of it in Russia than anywhere else. You know, Russia has the largest share of land in the Arctic, the largest share of territorial water in the Arctic, the largest share of people in the Arctic. And uh, understanding what's going on in terms without collaboration with Russians is very hard. And we, what I would say is that efforts are continuing in the current difficult circumstances to to work with Russians on terms. It's very hard. And uh, but that's not to say it's not happening at all, but it's very hard. And it's one of many reasons, of course, to, to hope that that uh, horrible war in Ukraine is brought to a, to a halt, and Russia eventually returns to uh, to membership in the civilized world. But nobody knows what that's going to be. And figuring out how to continue to collaborate on permafrost in between is challenging. Uh, the other thing I will say, though, is that permafrost uh, is not the only problem in terms of big uncertainties about how uh, natural environments and the influence of human-induced climate change can change the picture. Uh, the, currently, it looks like uh, a much bigger source of methane and permafrost form is wetlands in the tropics. And uh, that is also not very well understood. Exactly why that's happening to the extent it's happening, uh, what all the drivers are, what the future rates are going to be, uh, but between the permafrost and the tropical wetlands, it is certainly possible that such a big bite could be taken out of the carbon budget for human activities that it would not be possible at all to stop at 2 degrees C, the currently agreed uh, international target. Now, Dan is winning because Dan thinks it's probably impossible to meet 2 degrees C anyway, but it would become physically impossible to meet 2 degrees C if the emissions from permafrost and tropical wetlands uh, end up on the high end of the range of uncertainty. Uh, but let's throw it open to the audience. The panel has 
uh, talked a lot, and I see a question right here in the middle front row. Yeah, I'm, I'm an alum from 74 and um, climate activist, and my concern is that we've got some very smart people finally at Harvard addressing the problem, but there are also Harvard alumni who are very smart who are still denying it's a problem, and there, I don't know how many there are, but Harvard has about 400,000 alumni, and I wonder if anybody's considering what can be done to get another big segment of them engaged. Maybe there are 4,000 today that might be engaged, and that's, that's only 1%. So what are the psychologists being called in to see how we can get around the denial, or what's being done to address the other alumni? Well, let me make one quick comment and then see what other panelists uh, might, might want to add. Uh, I don't think denial is any longer the problem. Uh, the evidence of climate change and its impacts has become so conspicuous that the numbers of deniers uh, are shrinking rapidly. What's a much bigger problem is what I call the wafflers. The people who say, yes, it's happening, yes, humans are playing a role, uh, but it's too expensive or too difficult to do much about it, we're just going to have to hunker down. Uh, that's a much bigger problem today uh, than the deniers, and a growing problem is uh, the advocates of despair, uh, who are closely related to some of the wafflers, <clears throat> say it's impossible to do anything more cooked. Uh, and that, uh, that too, is a, is a big hazard today. Uh, how you energize the alumni in particular, um, it's a good question. I'm going to leave that to the I think there's a huge opportunity for education still. I'm personally working on an online course that I hope will reach a lot of people, including a lot of Harvard alumni. Um, I would say that I don't, I, th I think the denial or the antagonism towards climate change effort in general in this country it, it is tribal in nature. And I'm not sure going after it is, frankly, the, the going after it with reason is not understanding why it exists. I'm not sure. I think it's a waste of breath, frankly. Um, I do think, though, much more effective is to focus on people who are potentially very interested and responsive who just haven't been engaged. So I actually think politically the answer is not to focus on the people who are hardcore against it, but actually to focus on the middle that actually make a difference. Uh, I, with my friend John Marshall, created an NGO focused on marketing that actually focuses on that seg those segments. For example, the most movable uh, demograph demographic in the US on climate change might surprise people. It's Latina mothers. <laughs> Latina mothers, 50% of whom are Republicans. And most of them have never been approached by an environmental group of any sort. But they are movable. They show they're most movable on this issue, which is interesting. That's an opportunity. Yeah. Let's move along. I thought I saw Bill Hogan's hand up. No, I didn't. Okay, let's go uh, to the second of the back row near the aisle. Yes. Um, I'm Jennifer. I'm from Mass. Jennifer Feller from Mass Audubon, and I work with K-12 students. And I'm wondering, um, what is the role, I guess, of crowdsourced data? Do you see a role, a potential role? You know, we work with 100,000 students and then many thousands of other adults in the public every year. And we, you know, we love iNaturalist, but that only goes so far. I'm curious, what could we do to help, essentially? Or is there a role for students there? I think absolutely. And so um, I'm working on a project with Amazon Web Services right now where we're trying to develop a much more comprehensive database of yields and different agricultural activities around the world. So photographs that take place, individual farm level results uh, that have been historically collected or could be collected in the future could all be aggregated in one place and that could be analyzed uh, on a wholesale systematic level, which would be very helpful. And so that, that's one facet. Um, I'm sure there's others. Um, um, I would just say that in for, for health or for infectious disease surveillance in particular, there's a um, push to do participatory surveillance. 
So really trying to use communities to keep track of what's going on. And I think that's part of a wider um, technological push to decentralize and really make local data collection a reality. Uh, and I think that that's a, a wonderful development that has a lot of potential to, to give us granular data, as well as to make data that's actionable for communities. So it's not just surveillance, it's surveillance for a purpose in order to make decisions. Um, and I think that's a very hopeful place. One thing that I would add is that young people are interested in solutions. And uh, it's very important to be talking to young people uh, about climate change, not just to portray all the reasons for concern, but to talk about the solutions in which they can participate in terms of changes in individual behavior, changes in corporate behavior, changes in how we get our electricity, things that can be done to adapt uh, the resilience of your, of your community. I mean, I've found that young people uh, tend to get energized when you talk to them about solutions. Okay, yes, here. Uh, on that point, John, um, in, in hearing the panelists talk about <clears throat> the degree of uncertainty in each of your specialties, it made me think in business the way that we deal with that is scenario planning. When we think about Climate change, this is the mother of all scenario plans. And I, I have two questions that maybe panelists can react to. One is, how do you think about scenario planning that is so interconnected? Each of you have illustrated this point throughout your presentation. It's hard for me to get my mind around. How would you describe scenarios in the future that would encompass not just you, but all of your colleagues across all disciplines, because it's going to affect so much. And then to your second point, John, how do we do describe scenarios in a way that does not frighten us all to death, <laughs> that there's hope? Uh, because ultimately, that's what we need as humans. We need to see that there's some possibility to act. So how do we think about this in a different way around thinking about scenarios and how do we do it in a way that's constructive towards action? Well, a quick, a, a quick answer, and then others can elaborate. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has put a tremendous, tremendous amount of effort into scenario building, scenario analysis. Uh, and the only problem is that their multi-hundred page volumes are impenetrable by the average person. Uh, and, and or by anyone. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think more work needs to be done uh, on distilling some of those scenario-based results into more digestible form. Uh, but they have done a lot of work on the solution side as well. And there's a lot of encouraging uh, material about uh, the solutions and how they can be combined into scenarios that are less dismaying uh, than, than the worst cases that are often getting most of the focus. I actually think there's a risk of the other problem. I mean, I got to say, I, yes, John, that's right. There's lots of scenarios. I would say that, unfortunately, the IPCC has been irresponsible in refusing to attach any probabilities or likelihoods to any of these scenarios. They make the you know, <laughs> probability of us following a one and a half degree scenario the same as following a four degree scenario. And by my estimation, that's just not true. Um, so I totally agree that we don't want people to despair. At the same time, for scientists, we need to tell the truth. And telling, giving people hope by delusion is not hope. That's just manipulation. I think we have to be honest. And, and I, I actually, again, this is where a whole nother dimension of this problem comes in. There are people at Harvard, in particular, the writer Terry Tempest Williams and Matthew Potts, who's a minister of Memorial Church. We've been talking about the idea of climate grief with the idea that think about it as if it was a, um, a chaplain in a hospital who deals with somebody who's just been given a terminal diagnosis. They don't go to that person and say, it's OK. Everything's going to be OK. In fact, they're trained not to do that. They try to help the person accept the reality of what's going on and make the most and live as, as purposefully and as positively. But this is really important to understand about the climate system. There is no point where we give up on this. 
One and a half degrees is better than two degrees. Two degrees is better than three degrees. Three degrees is better than four degrees. Four degrees is better than six degrees. Six degrees is better than eight degrees. It just gets worse. So there is no point along the line where we say, oh, we failed too bad. We may as well just enjoy the ride. Um, that is not, that's not the, the situation we live in. So to me, um, accepting the reality of the situation and preparing for it is responsible and doing everything we can to limit future damage. But, but um, I, I, I get very uncomfortable when people try to you know, under communicate the risks or the reality of the situation in order to give people hope. That makes me very uncomfortable. Other questions? Yes, right here. So my question is to Caroline. We are about 8 billion almost getting away people on the planet and growing. Can you speak louder? We are about 8 billion people on the planet and growing. And then uh, we also have advancements in the medical field, which are going to increase the life expectancy of people. So do you think that the increase in life expectancy is bad? Or how does, how does it work? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I mean, so what we know is that if you lift people out of poverty and you make sure their children live over the age of five and have a reasonable life expectancy um, and give women access to contraception um, and education, then population sizes start to stabilize and even go down. Um, and so I think um, the increasing longevity, and I would say not just longevity, but healthy longevity um, is an important goal. But, um, but equally, I think the focus for thinking about population density and population growth in the future um, is less of an issue than making sure that we're addressing um, the drivers of poverty and malnutrition and infectious disease, all those things that kill people um, when they're too young, as it were. Right. So I think that's going to be the issue. So there, there was a woman up here. Yes. You? Yes. Hi. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very grateful for this. Thank you. Um, I am curious about hope. I work in the K-12 space. I work with educators in science education and in ecological innovation. Um, and hope is a big, important thing. I also am an addict to World Expos, where the world gathers and shows their best, exciting debut of a solution. And every year, the theme is, or every few years, the theme is definitely climate related in some way. So I've seen a lot of nations' contribution of, here's our exciting solution. Like, let's try this. Let's pull water out of the desert air and it's very exciting to see the model of this. So I am curious in your, you know, deeply studied commitment to understanding the reality and going deeper in your understanding of the realities, what are the things that you've seen or experienced that really do give you hope or things that are like an image that you hold onto if it is like, all right, four is better than six, is better than eight. Like, but those are so, they're like treasure to me to have those things that I can hold on to that I am working towards a hopeful future and trying to spread not fake hope, not fake hope, but like hope for children to have like competence and confidence and compassion to be able to commit to working towards it without fear? It's a really good question, and it's hard sometimes. I struggle. Every year I teach a course. Last, last fall I had 200 students, and I struggle with that balance between wanting to give them an honest, accurate assessment of where we are without having them throw up their hands and give up. And these are Harvard undergraduates and graduate students from across the university. So this is a pretty elite group of people. What do you do in a classroom of kindergartners or third graders or whatever? I think there's two things I personally take a lot of hope in. First of all, um, human, I said earlier, human adaptability is incredible, but also human innovation is remarkable. I'll give you one example that's specifically in the climate space. 
tropical cyclone, this is in Zhang's area, from, from Bangladesh, 1991. Huge tropical cyclone came ashore, killed 138,000 people. <coughs> What's interesting is three years later in 1994, almost the same storm, the same size, the same track, like the identical storm, same landfall location, killed like 600 people. What was the difference? The difference was the government of Bangladesh had instituted an early warning system so people knew it was coming. And two, they built a whole bunch of simple concrete bunkers. This is like low tech. This isn't billions of dollars. This isn't like expensive infrastructure. This is low tech, cheap infrastructure. I view that as incredibly helpful. Right? That, that's remarkable. Now, Bangladesh has a lot of other challenges for climate change. So it's not like they're out of the fire. But it's an example where humans are able to deal with incredible adaptability and, and use the resources they have to reduce their vulnerability. Um, and there are many examples of that. But I think, I think there are other ways, too. I also think that, frankly, sometimes in the desire to tell people how urgent and important this problem is, we forget to tell people that that doesn't mean that life is going to be horrible in the future. Um, many people will suffer in the future because of climate change. That's true. But that doesn't mean that everybody's going to suffer. In fact, it's pretty rotten to be in the poorest 2 billion people in the world today. If you look at the bottom quarter of people, they have a really miserable life. It's horrible to, to, to be destitute today in the world. So let me add something to Dan's comment about uh, innovation and disruptivity. And, and that is that across a very wide range of technological innovation, social innovation, policy innovation, we are learning, people are learning to make the approaches to mitigating climate change less expensive and to make the approaches to adapt to climate change and build resilience less expensive. And as that is happening, the willingness to use those measures is going up. And along with it, the recognition that we need to use them is going up because the damage of climate change is becoming more conspicuous. And those trends uh, are pushing us as painful as the trends are on the conspicuousness of climate change damage. The growing recognition of the danger and the increasing uh, economy of taking steps to mitigate the measure are driving society in the right direction. The other thing I take hope from is our young people. They are incredibly energetic. They're incredibly committed. They're incredibly smart. Uh, and we here at Harvard see uh, many of the best ones. And that is, for me, a source of continuing uh, optimism. We are out of time, I believe. Um, I'm sorry to say there were other questions we didn't get to, but let me thank the panelists.